Welcome back to RX Radio. I'm one of your many hosts, Killian Hamilton. Absent today is Jordan Shallow. He's somewhere in the Middle East, in a big concrete building in the sky, overlooking a man-made oasis. But me and Lundy are here today to bring you Sam Pedlow, Team Canada professional volleyball player. I have to say, if there's a podcast that I not only thoroughly enjoyed from the entertainment of it, but enjoyed from the motivation of it, it's got to be our discussion with Sam. The inspiration that he provides through the trials and tribulations, the quote-unquote adversity athletes face as they make it through the ranks of nationally sponsored sports. Sam has an incredible insight into work ethic. His stories of competition will teach you that even if you fail, get back out there and fail again. Uh, I have only the utmost respect and uh, admiration for Sam. I was really excited to get to talk to him. And I think even if a volleyball is not your sport, what you're going to take away from this, like I said, is just the absolute motivation and work ethic behind someone who's made it to the highest points they can make it as a national athlete. So now that we got our good friend Sam's intro out of the way, let's pay some bills. Upcoming April 25th is Skill Acquisition. It's an eight-week deep dive into advanced programming and organizational behavior. This course has been 18 months in the making. This is our fourth time uh, delivering it to you guys. I couldn't be more than excited to deliver the course this time around. It's a course that's constantly evolving, constantly finding its own identity. And I think we've come around to this on our, on our last uh, seminar trip in really deciding that skill acquisition is, at its core, advanced programming. It's an understanding of stress management. It's an understanding of exercise selection. It's an understanding of a macro and mesocycle view of programming and how we organize not only the training and volume of intensity, but we also organize the exercises we choose and where the athlete is in a competitive season. So I would love to have you in class. It starts April 25th. Log on to pre-script.com slash courses. Go to the skill acquisition button and I'll see you there. Now enjoy the episode. Now enjoy the episode. What were we just talking about? Beach volleyball, obviously. <laughs> Something related to Hide, volleyball. Hiding yeah. amongst the, the hype. Yeah. Oh, like as a player? Yeah, so I think there's a big difference when the stadium is empty and when the stadium's full. Like, believe it or not, I, I'm an introvert. Like, I'm going to finish this and go home and just, like, lie in bed for oh, two days. Oh, these guys are exhausting. And That's yeah, how most people are exactly. with us, though. But, hey, I, I can hang in the conversation and have a ton of fun. But even out there on the court, like, I prefer to be in my own little world. And when there's the crowd and there's all kinds of things going on, you feel like people get distracted. They're not just hyper-focused on you and what mm -hmm. you're doing. Um, and the, in the Olympic setting, there was no fans in the stands. So you got to realize you're on you know, national TV. That's in the back of your mind. You make a mistake, there's nowhere for the camera to pan. They're just hyper-focused on you. So that can be, you can become very self-conscious, right? And when that leaks into your game, like you, you've already lost. So, I, but wouldn't it work in the reverse? Like here's a room full of people where there's um, like more immediate consequences. Like, I would look at that and be like, oh, thank God there's not, you know, X thousands of people in the immediate proximity that are watching this. That would free my head up to be like, huh, okay, there's just like a, one of these square boxes here. Like, I don't give a shit. To me, it's like white noise. Like, you can kind of just like hide behind the chaos. Yeah. Um, I agree in the sense that if you get, you know, hyper fixated on what's happening around you, it can be almost worse. But for me, it almost feels like it's like the static. Like, no one's playing pure attention to you they're immersed in like uh, an experience yeah. that's really what beach volleyball is people don't go to watch me play beach volleyball they go there because it's it's a fun time right um so i feel like when the everything is empty you know you can pinpoint your coach you can pinpoint their coach you can pinpoint their staff everything it's all about like what's happening right there in that moment versus having a stadium full of people it's kind of just like I, I don't know how to describe There's it. There's like it's, a it's, camouflage against the herd. Exactly. It feels like a like a in an empty room. It feels like an assessment almost. Like yeah. it's like testing. Mm -hmm. Have you had that before? So we played when co the only time there's ever been empty stadiums is one if the tournament's in a horrible location give me an example china or of, of, of wow he oh. didn't even right there's for the a head. sound so bite it, for it james has, <laughs> it has nothing to do with uh china as a country but it does have to do with the locations they pick within china and the enthusiasm for beach volleyball in china it's not baseball 
and it's not baseball. So when we play in China, we're we used to be playing in places like Beijing and Shanghai, but、mm. now we're playing in Guangzhou, Yangzhou, these tinier、oh. cities that are you know they're not westernized. So it becomes very very challenging for us as athletes to have any type of normalcy. Like we can't go to the mall and get North American food. So you're really at the You know, helm of whatever the tournament wants to serve you. But the second thing is, they're in. It's not very much of a beach culture country, so fans aren't packing the stands to see any of the matches. So you're just playing in dead stadiums. Even in Qatar, we're playing in a completely dead stadium. It's one of the nicest stadiums in the world. It's in like an outdoor amphitheater that they truck sand into on Qatar Beach in Doha. But they actually pay people to come watch the finals because there are zero fans whatsoever watching any beach volleyball. So that's one of the biggest problems with our sport right now is we have lots of tournaments in these super exotic locations, but the product isn't being marketed very well because there's no one there to watch it. Shout out Qatar for the biggest flex of all time.、That's、did you、Qatar、see the high、thing. jumper? Yeah, they did the double gold medal. The double gold, which I didn't like.、Mm-hmm. What? Because you're, I'm not an athlete, obviously. But like, what's your take on that as an athlete in a sport where can you do that? Like, because someone has to lose the match and someone has to win the match,、so、right? We definitely can't. Right. I mean, so if I go down with an injury or I can't continue, the other team wins no matter、right. what. There's no subs or anything like that. So. That's really what beach volleyball is: is who's going to gas out first in these locations. You're playing in Qatar. I'm playing you. Well, it's you versus me, and <laughs>、yeah. Andre Agassi style. Like if you're going to cramp, then I win the game.、Yeah. So let's just go at one guy until somebody breaks. And I think with high jump, it's unique because at a certain pot- at a certain point, fatigue's going to f- set in, and neither of them are going to make the height. And that's what happened, right? They went to a jump yeah. off. They、yeah. both continued to clear. So at a certain point, does the best athlete win, or does one who Potentially trained a system that they don't need. Like、yeah. they don't need endurance to be a high jumper. Like you just need explosive power, clear the bar, you're good to go. Well, now it's into an endurance match, right? right? So, is the gold medal really the gold medal? So, I think you give it to the guy from Italy because the guy from Qatar jumped with a Richard Mill on his wrist. Did you see that? Yeah. So who was the、uh, sprinter from Jamaica at Commonwealth Games? Johan Blake. Johan Blake. Blake. He has his own、so、custom. The、yeah. hands of the watch on Johan Blake's、like、RM look like yeah. Yeah. His arms when he runs. So I met Johan Blake at Commonwealth Games in 2018. The track and field training center was at the same place as beach volleyball, and I don't care what you do. If you are at like the highest level in the world, it's interesting to talk to you, no matter what you do.、Yeah. So obviously, this guy's sitting on a bus, and we're the only other people there. I'm like, I want to talk to you about stuff and just like learn your mindset and how you approach your sport. And anyway, we got into talking about sponsors, and then we got talking about. His watch. Can you pull it up, Lundy? Can you pull up the Johan Blake Richard Mill? So in 2016, I think that was the first time he wore it in a major competition at the Olympics in、mm-hmm. Rio, and then they auctioned his watch off afterwards. And I can't remember how many millions of dollars it went, but I'm like, you're you're walking around by yourself in Australia with like a few mil on your wrist, and I got like, you know, twenty nine dollar Casio. Like I got to step my game up. Well, because you bring up an interesting point, and how much like when you look at beach volleyball and you're like, look, there's not a lot of eyeballs on the sport. How much of it do you put at the level of there? It is. Wow, eh? Jeez, I would pass it up for something in a Cracker Jack box. That's I w- the. I, w- I wouldn't aspire to own that. It's inherently the the Richard Mill. But for, so back to my point, it's like how much do you put the onus of that on the players, right? Like Johan Blake can, you know, obviously for whatever reason, track and field has sort of ascended to the pinnacle of Summer Olympics, but there's characters in. Running like I'd say Usain Bolt's character, his mannerisms, like messing around before, like that goes a long way in bringing people into the sport. Like you know, you do a great job on social media, like kind of documenting the training and putting up the、like, footage in all these different、mm-hmm. places. How much of it do you start to look around, not up at the stadium, rather at your other like your other competitors and be like, guys, what are we doing here?、Yeah. Like be more marketable. Well, I think in like the '80s and '90s in the states, like being a professional volleyball player. In California was incredibly lucrative. Like that was like the heyday of beach volleyball, and then we kind of went through this transition period where it became very difficult to make money playing beach volleyball. And you know, back then, even some of the legends of the sport, there are these characters that you self-identify with. And then I think we kind of went through like a fuzzy period where we lost that, and the sport became 
so structured because we were now in the Olympics and now we had a professional tour. Whereas before it was like very much a lifestyle. Like you grab a lawn chair, you plop it next to the court and then all of a sudden there's 10,000 people watching at a beach, but there's no stands. You know, people are interacting with the crowd. Guys are pulling one of the most famous clips is Karch Karai. He, after he lost, he actually pulls the entire net system down and the referee falls off the stand. If you did that now, you'd be kicked out of the sport for life. But we're starting to get back into that because I think the organization is realizing that the product itself is not the most important. It's the athletes themselves. And if we can make marketable athletes and athletes that people relate to, then maybe we can start to bring money back into the sport. And as we were touching on before, volleyball is not incredibly lucrative when it comes to prize money. So you got to figure out a way to survive. And for me, I knew that the way that that was going to work was I had to create some type of brand surrounding myself. So I was the first guy to be making, I was making my own hats in China and shipping them over at like 250 hats at a time, trying to mail them out of my, you know, dining room table, going to the post office and being that guy who's got like 50 packages to mail. And there's a line about <laughs> the door at the cliffside milk next to my house. <laughs> But, um, you know, and then that evolved into, you know, making shorts and selling jerseys and then ultimately kind of making training programs like I do now. But now we're starting to see more and more guys adopt that, like, who am I within the sport? Like, what is my character and how can I make myself more marketable? So I think we're moving in the right direction, but it's been a struggle for the sport. Do you ever get candid conversations of guys coming to you being like, where do I start? So I would say in 2016 was when I... I took my personal Instagram and I'm like, this is going to be a business. And I think that that's the biggest thing is people need to realize in volleyball and, you know, at my level, it, it is a business. It's not mm -hmm. just you like posting random stuff when you want to, or it will never work. And I think at first people didn't understand that. And I got made fun of like crazy. Like, why do you spend so much time on this app? And I was like, because in four years I'm going to sign a major sponsor and it's going to make the biggest difference in my life. And I did. And that's when people were like, hey, what did you do? I'm like, well, you're five years behind now. Like, this isn't a short-term game. You're mm -hmm. not going to, in one month, all of a sudden, you know, change your online presence. Like, if you do this every day like a job, it will pay off. And now you see more and more and more guys doing that. More guys have merch. More guys are creating programs. You know, even the Norway guys who just won the Olympics, they partnered with a watch brand. So they're like one of the first guys to, you know, they actually wear a legit watch on their arm while they're playing now. So it's migrating towards that. And in certain markets, it's way easier to do that. Like if you're a European volleyball player, yeah. it's way easier. Volleyball on the world scale is like in the top five viewed sports in the world. It's just not that popular in North America. Do you attribute that just to the emergent, like a... Um football, baseball, hockey, that kind of thing, just to steal his eyeballs? Yeah, I think um, in Europe, indoor volleyball is humongous. Like, if you watch those guys, that's where the money is in volleyball. Mm -hmm. Those guys aren't playing beach volleyball. You watch professional indoor volleyball. I think one of uh, the female players, she's playing for an uh, Italian club team. She just signed a four-year deal for $6 million. And that's the highest paid volleyball player in history. Six million bucks for four years. And it's a female player. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, like uh, the girl who the female player who went down for team usa sheridan atkinson maybe her name she's very tall uh she plays in france but she has like yourself a massive instagram following like if you went to her instagram you wouldn't know she's a professional volleyball player she looks like some style celebrity yeah exactly so people i would say i have a larger following it's probably divided half of them are following me for volleyball half of them are following me for fitness and well i don't know maybe 40% are volleyball, 50% are fitness, and then like 10% is like cats and babies. That's Instagram. Yeah. That's really Instagram, yeah. a cross section. Do you have like, is there people in the sport that are like characters that you wish got out there more? Like, do you have any people that are like Johnny McEnroe's or like Christos Kyrgios or uh, Nick Kyrgios's of the sport where you're just like, man, this guy is an animal. Like at, when all is said and done, we go out and like this guy is, like he'd be lights out. So I would say probably the most marketable athlete in the world for beach volleyball is a guy named Adrian Carambula. He's a guy who was, I believe he was born in Uruguay. He left Uruguay. I don't know if it was for political reasons, but there was something going on down there that didn't make sense for his family to stay. So they ultimately ended up in Florida. And if you look at Adrian Carambula, like you should pull him up. You look at him on paper. There's no way you would be like, this is one of the best volleyball players in the world. The guy's like barely six foot. If it comes to a gym, it's not his favorite place in the world to be, but from a physical fitness point of like standpoint for volleyball, he holds his own and he wins tournaments. But 
his whole thing is he has what's called a sky ball. So traditionally in volleyball with serving, you're just going to think a guy's going to jump it up and hit it over the net, right? Well, his thing is he's actually going to launch it into the air as high as he possibly can, and it will end up in your small helicopter pad. But it's incredibly difficult to track. So his name is Mr. Skyball. So you can see kind of in the bottom, the very bottom there, he's hitting a skyball. So he's launching it towards the ceiling. And if you type in Adrian Karambula Skyball on YouTube, you'll see it. But what's happening is he's putting so much spin on the ball that it's actually coming back to the net. So he hits it up, it looks like it's right on top of you, but it's actually running away from you the whole time. Um, so he became incredibly popular when he came on tour because he has this this insane serve and he gets an ace right here. So you'll see it's what like way- What the hell was, was that? that? So look what? at Qatar, they don't even know where it is. So he what spun the? 180. Dude, what is you run that back, dog. Is this Mario Tennis? <laughs> what the hell did he just do? So this will have all of his serves and it's wild. So this guy, could. Sharif, he finished third at the Olympics. He's an unbelievable athlete. He's from Senegal, but he plays for Qatar. And he just got turned around completely because the the wind is blowing off of the ocean towards the hotel. So it's blowing the ball sideways. So he's hitting it yeah. into the wind and then it comes back into the court. And it's incredibly difficult to track because I, I don't know what other sport would be the appropriate analogy, but it would be like somebody passing a hockey puck to you that comes towards you for a certain period of time, then stops and runs away from you. So you're kind of waiting for it and you're like, well, this isn't going to come to me. So you go forwards and that ends up in a completely different location. <laughs> the fact that he's able to not just drop that into yeah. like Miami from yeah. Cancun. So like, that's where he went to though. He's from Miami and now he's playing for Italy. But that's all his serves are that. No, so his whole thing is he won most. So you'll see there, he actually served the ball on match point and it hit the, the top of the net and went over. So that's the thing is that ball, when you're first looking at it, is probably four, five feet on your side. Yeah. And then by the time it gets to you, it, it hit the net. Do you have a good idea in his setup when you play against him that you know where this thing, like he's pulling one of these sky no, no. ball moves? Oh, you know he's doing it because he's standing sideways and he's serving the ball underhand. Okay. But you, you have no idea where the ball will be. Is this, okay, pre this guy who looks like uh, the other part of Car Ramrod from uh, Super Troopers, <laughs> was this a thing or did he popularize this? So there was another guy named Dana in Florida that he learned this serve from, or Dana was like the first guy to be using it as his go-to. Okay. And then Adrian was down in Florida and then he, you know, took the serve to the next level and then he brought it to the world tour. So he is the only player on the world tour who <laughs> this is his go-to serve. So like out of 10 serves, he's, he's probably won. eight times. Shut the oh, fuck so up. So it's not like a curveball. This is like his thing. This is him throwing a curveball eight out of 10 times every time. That's and insane. then the other two times, so he has one most creative. He is also doing unorthodox serve. So like when I'm serving, I'm tossing the ball up in front of me and I'm trying to hit the shit out of it as yeah. hard as I can, straight down the middle. And if it's a hundred kilometers an hour, I got a good chance at getting a, a like a, a pass that's out of system and we might generate points. For him, he's like Yahtzee. I'm gonna hit it up in the air as high <laughs> as I can. And then you get these crazy plays. And then his other serves are instead of throwing it up and hitting it as hard as he can, he'll throw it up and he'll hit it with as much side spin as he can. Or he'll go up like he's going to hit it hard and then he'll just tap it. So he, he's always about like movement and confusion. So, so how an, an annoying is this right. in the game of volleyball? Like, Dude. is this something where you're like this guy again, like this clown? So, no offense to him, but like, he's like, oh, him again. Yeah. We've been fairly successful against Adrian. So the last time I played him was in Gestad in 2018 and we beat them 2-0. Um, but if you don't know what to do with this serve, it takes you a long time oh, to get, get your feet underneath you. And once you're down 20 to 14 at our level, you're, you're done. Yeah. If, you, if, if they open up the gap three, four points, it's the almost impossible so to come back. Yeah. Because at the men's game, like Jordan said, we're all so big yeah. that if I can control the ball, the chance of me siding out is so high mm -hmm. that you have to put them in trouble with the serve. And he's been successful doing it here. So see there, he jump sets, which not a lot of guys are doing jump setting. And if you jump set, most of the time you jump, you're gonna attack the ball. So the blocker is gonna go up and try and block. He's like, no, I'm gonna set my partner. You get a no block. So, is he jump setting too because he's short? So watch here, jump set fast, poke down. 
So he's not jump setting because he's short. He's jump setting to give the illusion that he might attack the ball on two. So the blocker has to decide which player he will play defense against. <gasps> so like throws the rhythm off. Dude, exactly. Well, you keep running that back. That is amazing to me. Because so, like technically he's a solid player. Technically he's undersized and should not be successful at the right. world level. But like from a, like an actual, I mean, he's able to engage in rallies and stuff. From, like from, from that the tactic, execution of yeah, volleyball, yeah. he knows what he's doing. But if you looked at him on paper, stature wise, you'd be like, this, there's no way that this guy should be doing what he does. Now, how does he rank on the world stage? This is So he made the Olympics. Uh, I think he got fifth or ninth at the Olympics. It's his second Olympics. Um, before he moved, so he was an American mm -hmm. um, or he was living in the States. But his family left Uruguay and was in the States. I don't know if it was legally or illegally, but he decided that playing for the U.S., I don't even know if he was eligible to play for the U.S., okay. but in his current location, he wasn't going to be able to do this. So he had an Italian passport. He moved to Italy to try and make the 2016 Olympics. He made it, but he can now not go back to the U.S. Wow. So he took an opportunity to go to Italy, made the Olympics, and then now he plays as an Italian player. Um, and he's been incredibly successful. He's also playing with another guy who his name's Rossi, who again, didn't have a ton of success until he paired with Adrian and they just started playing like video game volleyball. Like, this, this is, is the most stuff, frustrating yeah. shit yeah. I've ever, this is like a street baller is trying to go into the NBA. This is and like, like and, trotter. Yeah, and like one and one stuff. tour. Yeah. Oh. So like, obviously like you have, you know, from the sounds of it, like a fair deal of, of respect for Adrian and how he plays. Are there, would there be like more European, like long time Orthodox volleyball players that are irritated by his presence in the game? Yeah, because it's something you don't see. So depending on where you're from, I've always said that like North American volleyball is North American volleyball. Yeah. I'm sure it's the same in hockey, right? Like guys who are playing in Europe play completely different. So like when we go down to California, we're playing North American volleyball. It's bump, set, pass. Phil Dalhauser's on the screen there. He's in white. He's the 2008 Olympic champion. He's arguably the greatest beach volleyball player of all time. And okay. Adrian's making him look stupid here. You know, that's him and his partner right there. Phil's number two. Uh, you know, he won 2018 wow. Olympics. He's like six foot ten. He gets his pecs over the net. It's ridiculous playing this guy. So, you know, when Phil plays a guy like him, for sure, he's up he's irritated because yeah. it's it's different right mm -hmm. and that's why adrian's had so much success is because it's so different and now we're starting to see a lot more guys on tour abandon the classic like bump set attack now when you're seven foot you don't need to abandon that style you can yeah. just be seven foot but when you're six foot five like i am sometimes it makes sense to create a ton of motion and confusion and then you don't have to be as powerful. You don't have to be as high because there's going to be opportunities where the defense is moving and you just have to hit it where they're not, right? The court's so big that we can't cover it all, but it's a chess game as to which section of the court is actually open. And if I can figure that out, I see you and I'm like, that's the section that's open. I'll score 100% of the time. The game is just trying to figure out which section of that helicopter pad is open. Interesting. Is there, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say like, to me, like the idea of like it being like chess, like I don't know anything about volleyball, obviously, because I'm five foot nothing. So that wasn't a sport <laughs> I got to ever learn. But it sounds like boxing or football to me. Like there's this idea of like countering, right? Like is this something where you watch a lot of video of the other team and like you have like you counter this person, you counter that person best? Like Yeah, so the way it would be set up in you know, a simplistic way is I have tendencies, like I have every single attack that the person I'm playing has done in the last four years. Yeah. So I know exactly what you're doing. It's just whether or not I can stop it. Okay. So I know if you are out near the antenna, which is like the sideline marker at the net, if you're out there, you are most likely to do this so then we will game plan hey let's start doing this against that and see how things go the difference and the challenging part for us is like when you look at a football game no one's thinking how windy was this game yeah you know unless everyone missed field goals and they're like shit that game was windy whereas for us you know you're playing in a place like cancun that is on the physical beach you're always going to have a crosswind yeah you go to some of these other locations you're going to have a headwind so tendencies will be completely different based on the conditions um so you could have all the game plan in the world and then it rains and that's Let's what see. happened to us in mexico so in order for us to qualify for the 2021 olympics we were one spot outside of the world ranking. So you had to be top 15, we were 16. 
it was shit, but now we got to go through this backdoor route to qualify for the Olympics. And they have um, different zones, Asia, ours is North America, Central America, Caribbean, and then there's um, Oceania and Europe. So we had to go to Mexico to play teams from our division. And if we won, then we got a spot at the Olympics. So we moved to Florida. We're living in Florida the whole time because Mexico is supposed to be like 40 degrees every single day and we want to be acclimatized. Mm -hmm. So we live in Florida. I leave my baby at home and we're like, great. We're practicing at 12 o'clock every single day, like dying of heat. We feel super prepared. We go down to Mexico seven days early. We know the Mexican Federation is going to put us at the hottest time in the day every single match before we play Mexico because they want to try and gas us out. That's so that's hilarious. what they did. Sons of bitches. Yeah, so it's great. You know, we're in like peak condition. Yeah. We're by far the fittest team there. We are ready. Everything is going smoothly. And we wake up the next day to play and it's the most it's ever rained during a match ever. And it was like 16 degrees. So I was training oh, no. in like plus 40, 16 degrees and rainy. So against Mexico. Yep. Game in plan. Mexico. Oh yeah. They yeah. made that happen. Yeah. Game plan you. out the window. It's like who can play better yeah. volleyball in the rain? And we lost. So it was like for four months we planned for a game that never happened. And yeah. it was just who's gonna win in the rain. And the rain is completely different because the ball is slippery and everything about our sport is tactile. Yeah. So gonna, yeah. if the ball rotates two or three times, it's an indication that maybe you didn't touch it at equal time and it's a double. So it's blown and it, it, they get the point. So now you're thinking about bump setting all the time. The ball's not nearly as grippy, so you can't manipulate it in the same way. So it's it's really like the great equalizer. And does like, so I would think the physics of the ball changes as well because the rain would essentially make it heavier. Exactly. It changes barometric pressure and yes. the ball's so light. Yeah. And depending on where you play, how many balls do they have? So were those balls used for four matches before you? Oh, or did you get a fresh, deflate, fresh set of balls? Yeah. Like classic tactics. So when we play in Norseca, which is North America, Central America, Caribbean, when we go down to the islands, the tournaments are not run at the same quality as if they're in Vienna. Yeah. So they might not get as many volleyballs for the tournament. So if it rains the first two days, by the time you get to the final, instead of using brand new balls, you're using medicine balls. Yeah, this waterlogged yeah. foam so, ball. So there's a lot of guys who've like torn their rotator cuff because they're they're hitting a medicine ball it's at the so end of the heavier, tournament. so much heavier, Exactly. So it's weird that I would think, uh, this is, I guess, ridiculous, but like in high school when I played sports, both teams always brought balls and then they just shared a collaboration of balls to make it fair. Like when I played rugby, both teams would have balls and it would be like four rugby balls, two from each team. And it would just equalize any kind of nonsense. But are they at least the same ball? Oh no, they'd be four different balls. This is high school rugby. Yeah. So this would be like giving Tom Brady at our level. This yeah. would be like giving Tom Brady a Wilson. And yeah. then I don't even, who's the other company that makes a football? I don't know. Spalding. So yeah, right. so that'd be like, yeah, that'd be like basketball. Like, yeah. okay, you're going to, for this, for the first half, yeah. you're going to use Wilson, then you're going to use a Spalding. They'd get yeah. the Spalding and be like, what, what the fuck is this? Yeah. That's what would happen for us too. That's crazy. So the mm -hmm. Americans, the AVP, uh, American Volleyball Professionals, they use a Wilson and mm -hmm. it's a completely different ball than the Macasa. And the Macasa is like the world standard. Mm. So it's like the Alico of barbells um, or volleyballs, but uh, it's a way harder ball to play with. The world tour ball is, is way more difficult. The Wilson is like a training volleyball. It's like a sponge. If it hits you, it's going to go up no matter what. The Mikasa, oh, if you're not controlling it, it's gone. So guys don't like it as much because it's, it's a really challenging ball to play with. Crazy. Now, are they a different size? They're the same size. One's heavier and spongier. So it's oh, okay. more forgiving. Yeah, I guess um, so. So one, you have to like actually put more into the ball to make it do what you want it to do. The other one, you just have to hold a position. I see. So like passing a Wilson, I just have to hold my position. It's going to hit me and it's going to go where it is. The Macasa, if you don't like give it something, it's just going to hit you and like fall five feet in front of you. Oh, weird. So the Americans all play with this other ball and then they come on the world tour and there's plenty of really, really good American volleyball players who've never had successful, successful international careers because they can't adopt to the ball. Crazy. That seems like such an easy problem to fix. No, you always want to use the harder ball. Yeah. Like why right. wouldn't you just buy one? Um, so they, oh. the reason I believe okay. they have them, no question. They yeah. train with them all the time. But when you play on the AVP and you're not the top, top, top guys that are making money internationally, like the top Americans, they're making really good money playing international. The mid-level Americans, most of their money is coming from their domestic tour and mm -hmm. their domestic tour uses this oh. secondary ball. So they're using that way more in practice, whereas the top guys are using the international I ball see. and then adapting back to the, the, easier, the ball. easier ball. So yeah, it's really a, it's like the economics of beach volleyball. 
you wouldn't think, and this is, you know, I guess, you know, ignorant to some extent, but it's like, I think you think about all the nuance of it. Like as we're talking about, it, it's like, it all makes sense. I'm like, yeah, the ball, the rain, this is, but when I watch beach volleyball, men's beach volleyball, it's you're not, not what's on my men, mind. You're not watching men's beach volleyball. Nobody watches men's beach volleyball, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> we're only talking about it now. Nobody does. Um, but it's like, I never thought about any of this. I was just like, yeah, these guys are really tall. Yeah. And I think people don't appreciate how difficult the sport is until we go out there and play it. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of, we, in volleyball, there's always this conversation. Okay. Like what five basketball players would you make a volleyball team? And I guarantee you put any of those five basketball players in a beach volleyball court and it's just going to be horrible. Oh, like they I are going no to be doubt. the least athletic looking people yeah. in the world. Like the thing about volleyball to me, and I've watched indoor volleyball more than beach volleyball is like, I go back to like this idea of the rhythm of it. It's so insane. The choreography of playing volleyball and beach volleyball is like almost to more an extent because there's only two of you, yeah. but it's just watching like this pattern and rhythm to what's going on. I could never do this. It's not reactionary like other sports. It's so like, it's a dance. You yeah. have to know where the other person is with respect to beach volleyball. You have to know where the other person is at all times and what you're doing in the situation based off of what's happening in front of you and then do that without talking. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, everything's a no look pass. It's yeah. like, it just always feels like a no look pass the whole game. So I'd, I'd be curious if I'm on the other side of the aisle and I'm researching you. Yeah. So I'm me and Killian, are, we're paired up. Yeah. Get on my shoulders. We're doing some little rascal <laughs> shit. What What are the concerns when playing you? Like, what are people like? Fuck. Here comes Sam. We got to do Captain Canada again. The guy with the beard. We kick sand in his beard. Like, yeah. what do we do here? Like, what is what is like your game? So I've always described myself as a sledgehammer, not a chisel. So there's guys out there who are going to use like fine motor control and hit like very narrow parts of the court. That's not my game. Like if you're standing cross court and I know the blocker's not going to dive in front of me, I'm going to try and hit you in the neck and then hopefully <laughs> you'll back up and then I'll hit the sideline and then you'll come forwards and then I'll hit you in the neck again. We hit the ball so hard that the chance of you standing in front of it and being like, just hit it at me, I'll dig it is so low that those are the opportunities I'm taking. Somebody who's more of a chisel might say like, well, I can just do a really easy shot away from this guy and it will score. But it comes down to what you can see in front of you. You know, much like a, a quarterback can't throw a pass to someone they can't see. For me, it's what's in front of me is always like a little bit blurry, right. but I know I'm stronger and more powerful than you. So if I make the right decision and hit a high quality shot, I'm going to score. So. I would assume a team who's playing me, they're trying to get their blocker in front of me as much as possible. Because if I can hit it past the blocker, I'm usually hitting it hard enough that even if you're in the right spot, you're not going to get a quality touch out Give of it. Give me some speeds here. Like, what are we talking? So the, the fastest serve in the world is 113, um, 113 kilometers an hour. What? Um, and we're hitting the ball like 100, 100 kilometers an hour plus. Like my serve, which would be like a conservative serve, is over 80 kilometers an hour. So like, it's not ridiculously fast where you feel like you can't even get a touch on it, yeah. but you have to think that, you know, if you, if you and Killian are playing and you're blocking as the taller individual and maybe vertically wise also higher, I'm not I, sure. He's getting over, he's getting way higher than I am. Probably. So Killian's blocking, you're playing defense. I'm getting uh, So if watch. I know Killian's blocking line and you're standing in the diagonal and like I've identified that and I know you're there, you also know that you're screwed at this point. So you're obviously going to start to advance in the court because you're like, this is the only chance I have. He's going to hit it down. Well, you know, 80 kilometers an hour when I'm six feet away from you is way different than if uh, you're 12 feet away from me, right? So the perceived speed is is pretty fast. 80 kilometer an hour serve is way different than an 80 kilometer an hour attack where, again, you're only like six feet from me. So the good thing is it's an inflatable ball and it, it really doesn't hurt. Like you can get hit in the head, I mean, your sunglasses explode and it's not like you got hit in the head with a, I don't know, it's not like you got punched in the face like you're a boxer. Do you have a couple like like where you almost feel bad? Where like you drilled someone in the face and it's like, well, it's part of the game. Like I, I make the comparison to tennis a lot because oh, obviously yeah. the style of yeah. the layout. Like I remember Kyrgios blasted uh, Federer or Nadal in the chest. And he was like, no, he's doing all right. He makes a few million dollars. He's okay. So... I would say I often get hit in the head more often than I hit someone else in the head, but there was, so my partner and I tried to qualify for the 2016 Olympics. We missed, I played four years with a guy, his name's Grant O'Gorman. Uh, and then I switched to my partner who I played the last five years with. The very first tournament of the year, after we broke up in 2016, I played my old partner. 
So <laughs> we left on good terms, but in that game, uh, my old partner, there's two styles of defense. You can play deeper where your hands are low or you creep up in the court and your hands are high. Um, so Grant is a creep up in the court, keep your hands high kind of guy. So he gets a lot of hand digs. But in this situation, um, again, I hit it harder than he could get his hands up fast enough. And I drilled him right in the head and his glasses broke. But the rally went on. He actually got the ball over the court. And then I, I you know, I finished the rally. But, you know, you hit your old partner square <laughs> in the head the first game back. But as a blocker, you're more often getting hit in the head than the defender because we're going up and trying to take away so much space. Yeah. And at our level, most guys see you and they're not aiming for you. They're aiming around you. So there's no point in like having narrow hands because yeah. no one's hitting it there. Yeah. So you're often going really wide, but then they realize you're doing that and then they're just going to go straight down the middle. So they're going to hit you right in the head. So there's actually a clip on my Instagram in Qatar. We're playing Poland. Um, and I got hit in the head so hard, but I got it off the top of my head, which is fine. If you get it off the top of your head, everything's good. If you get it in the sunglasses or the nose, that's when it's really bad. But the ball went so high in this Coliseum stadium and the wind was so heavy. The ball was on our side at the middle of the court. So you can see me, it goes off my head. I run into the middle of the court because I'm going to get the ball. And then I start running to the net because the wind is blowing it from behind me back over the net. So this ball went four meters off the net and then blew four meters and landed on their side and I scored. So you can off see Off the it. dome. Off the wow. dome. With the assist, but, holy shit. So a lot of guys are getting hit in the head a lot at our level because guys are so high above the net now. And there's no animosity. No, it's just part of the game. I mean, you say sorry to the guy, you didn't mean to hit him in the head. Yeah. yeah. Maybe broke his sunglasses, but you just grab another pair from the backpack and away you go. Do you have any, like, are there, like, either personally or say. do you have any good rivalries where it's like, okay, like, is there enough space in the game to engage in, like, a, I don't know, a dialogue? Like, is there trash talk? Is there, is, are there teams where you play? You're like, yo, I want this one. Like, yeah. more than, more than all of the ones that I'm sure you want to win, like, so in volleyball, you can't talk through the net. So I can't go right up to the net and, you know, you and I get John into it. John Cena, that shit. But subtly, you can do it in different ways. Um, it's interesting when you talk about relationships on the world tour for volleyball, because it's very similar to tennis. And they've come out and talked about this a lot, but you're alone. Like I'm traveling the world by myself with Killian as my partner mm -hmm. and I've been doing it for five years. I don't want to sit in a hotel room and talk to Killian anymore yeah, because I know everything no, about him. You don't. So you got to... <laughs> What are you, you're going to go to dinner by yourself or you're going to go to dinner with somebody else on tour. And then the next day you might have to play that person, but you're kind of friends until you get to the business side mm. of the sport. So the way the point system works out, sometimes you can play the same team a lot every week. So uh, leading into the Olympics, we ended up playing Latvia, Samoylov Smedens, like every week for five or six weeks. So you get this rivalry between you like i like them they're nice guys but like i'm not gonna lose this week to you guys or i'm gonna beat you again this week whatever it might be so yeah you get these kind of rivalries this animosity but off of the court there's still guys that i would be like hey like do you want to go to the great wall of china tomorrow we got nothing to do and we could just go and have a good time so there's not too many people on tour where you would be like fuck that guy like i don't even want to sit close but there to is a few because you said there's not too yeah, many there is a we've, it more has to do with cultural differences, to be yeah. honest. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're sitting, some teams don't speak English at all. So there's this, sometimes there's an assumption they don't speak English, but that they're, they're dicks. And it's like, they're not dicks. They just don't speak English. Yeah. So they kind of stick to themselves. The South Americans, the Brazilians, they kind of stick to themselves. Um, and, you know, when you play those teams, you really want to beat them because usually the teams that stick to themselves are really, really good. Yeah. But it's also incredibly difficult to do that for years and years, travel the world and then just be by yourself all the time. That, yeah. that in my opinion is the hardest part of the sport. Waking up at four o'clock and working out before you go to practice or training in a warehouse all winter, like that shit's easy. But like traveling the world by yourself, if you can't interact with other people, it's really challenging. I'm interested in the interpersonal relationship between partners because you kind of alluded to like, because that's, I mean, most of my relationships haven't gone five years. So like the fact that I had a marriage that didn't go five years. Yeah. So the fact that you were five years with one dude and you use the phrase break up, 
Like, is this a, look, we got to talk. Like, I was, do you just come home one night and there's a lamp on? Like, where were you? Like, how does that, <laughs> how does that go? And then how do you, how do you form a new partnership? Yeah. Like, so we always say there's like a honeymoon stage. Anytime you get with a new person, it's like you have a new girlfriend. So everything's like hunky dory. If you do something wrong, it's kind of like, oh man, no worries. Like, it's all good. And then five years down the road, you know, you do something wrong. It's like, what the fuck were you yeah. doing? Like, get your shit together. But with respect to forming and breaking partnerships, like the Federation doesn't have anything to do with it. It's all up okay. to the individuals playing. Um, and it's really kind of like dating, to be honest, because you don't know how it's going to work until you get out there, like what the chemistry is going to be, how you guys are going to play, what's going to happen in super tough situations. Um, it's not all like Killian's a great player. I'm a great player. We'll do really well together. Yeah. That happens sometimes because it's a business relationship. It's just better when you also have a personal relationship that can make the shitty times in the business relationship seem better. Um, because there's going to be a time when it's garbage. Like, you don't qualify for the Olympics and you got to figure out what's going on. But so after 2016, when I was playing with Grant, 2016 Olympics for me were like, no one on paper said like Pedlo and O'Gorman, you guys are going to go to the Olympics. But we had like a really solid finish to that qualification in 2016 that earned us a spot to go to that Continental Cup, that last chance qualifier. And then we ended up winning that, but we had to play the team in front of us from Canada to go to the Olympics which was my current partner and his old partner. So as soon as we lost that, I knew my current partner's partner would be retiring. So I'm like, this is, this is like me getting a promotion. I'm going from team three in Canada to team two. And then we ultimately became team one. So I just like put my name out there. I was like, Hey, do you want to go to lunch and talk about like next year and what will happen? We played one tournament together. We won the continental championship. And then we're like, okay, let's make a run at this and see what happens. So that was kind of my old partner was caught off guard. He was upset because we got ourselves into a situation where we were finally doing it. Like we were in the grand slams of tennis at this point, instead of just playing opens all the time. And then I kind of took a, a promotion and he took a demotion. So, you know, sometimes there's hard feelings surrounding those situations versus this time, you know, we, my partner, I didn't qualify for the Olympics. He wants to go for 2024. And I'm like, I think my run at the Olympics has taken its course. Like I understand it. You go play with whoever you want to. Um, so he's picking up a new guy and then I'm kind of now a journeyman. So, you know, I'm not interested in shooting for the Olympics. So I'll play mostly domestic North American events, some international events, but you know, no longer am I going to go to China for like four weeks at a time and just hang out in a McDonald's in the mall, but in between matches cause they have Wi-Fi. So was there an identification of uh, like complementary skill sets? Was that a big part of it? Like when you were promoting, like promoting up to this partner, like is he a pedlo? Like is he a fucking hammer? Is he a chisel? Do they look for that dynamic? So he's a defender. I'm a blocker. So usually the blockers have, they have the power because there's less of us. There's less people who are blocking full time. It's a way more physical role. Like my partner's actually taller than me, but he's a defender. Usually blockers are spin serving, running to the net. And then when it gets super hot, everyone is serving the blocker because we usually have more touches on the ball, more energy expenditure. When it comes to selecting a partner, I'm obviously going to look for a defender every single time. Like I'm not going to look for another blocker. So that's the case there. So I'm looking for a complimentary defender to my style. Um, and if he plays the opposite side of the court as me too, right? Like I play left side, he plays right side. I'm a blocker, he's a defender. He's the number two defender, I'm the number three blocker. It just like made sense. Whereas you can get these other dynamics that people are trying to like break the mold, like the Dutch, they're taking two humongous guys who are not particularly strong at defense and all they're worrying about is offense. Like if we can, if we can put a, enough pucks in the net, we're going to win. It doesn't matter how many they score as long as we score more. So that's really their mentality is like, if we side out at a super high level, we don't have to get very many digs and we'll still win the game. But that's kind of where the game's going is they're trying to like money ball it a little bit versus, you know, the classic volleyball where it's just like, we're just going to go out there and battle and whoever wins, wins. So it's, it's changing, which is good for the sport. But at the same time, the historians don't necessarily like the evolution that's happening. Are you in the relationship of, or the partnerships you've had, are you always the meathead? Oh, uh, so when I started with Grant, Grant and I were like 
the hardest working team, hardest working team on tour, no question. All we wanted to do was smash weights and practice. Um, and it was perfect because Grant was hella strong. He's an undersized guy. He won medals at the under 21 world championships, under 19 world championships. And all he wanted to do was get, we wanted to be physically the strongest team we possibly could. And it was awesome. Cause I was like, Hey, what do you want to do today? We're just going to go work out. And then the partner I moved into on my second kind of quad, he was having injuries and really wasn't utilizing, you know, fitness and training to help his volleyball performance. And as he partnered with me, he kind of took that full on. And now I think at 33, he's the best he has ever been and will be as long as he continues to supplement his on-court performance with the off-court stuff. Because like we kind of talked about earlier, there's a lot of guys out there that don't work out at all. And they're just gifted at the sport and they they invest themselves in the sand wholeheartedly and that's it you know you alluded to it on earlier podcast it's like their neurological bank they spend it yeah. all on on sand so they might be using med balls hurdles things like that and they practice like crazy in north america it's very much like we practice for two hours we don't do we do technical skills and competition mm -hmm. but there's nothing that looks like fitness on the sand it's all done in the gym do you gauge like I I would have a hard time gauging buy-in if I had a partner that wasn't like in the gym. Right? Like is it tough for you like on both ends obviously like you we haven't really got into like your physical therapy side of it but just from like your wantingness and willingness to train I would look at that and be like if it was me and him and he missed a point it's like yeah you didn't fucking miss that workout last week too you bitch. Like I would I would <laughs> I would foster such an animosity for that. Your deadlift sucks. Yeah, you can't right? do that ball. So I think this is where that relationship part comes in. And it's that the way it's always worked for me um, most successfully is that if we have an understanding that we are both giving 100%, then I have no problem with what you're doing, but you better be dedicating yourself 100% to it. So if the weight room is not where you feel like you're getting your results from, obviously there's a bare minimum that needs to be done in order to be successful as a professional athlete. But I know my success came from being physically fit. I know some of my other partner's success was aided by that, but that's not where they're getting the most out of it. Mm -hmm. They might be getting the most out of video review, technical work, things like that. I got the most because I had a high volleyball IQ, but I wasn't fit enough. And then through university, I kind of ticked that box. Um, my other partner, again, the physical fitness thing helped him be even better, but that wasn't what made him his best. What made him his best was he was like a real tactician of the game. Like he dissected the game more wholeheartedly than anyone I'd ever met. And I'm sure he looked at me and was like, you don't dissect the game to the level necessary to be as good as you are, but you train so bloody hard that you kind of make up for it. So you kind of have to have an understanding what you are great at might not be what I'm great at. So we might dedicate our time in different areas differently. That's gotta be t like, have you ever had any big gaffes, like any big gaffes in the sense where it's like a game's on the line and you just fuck up because like I will, well, me, I, well, no question. I'm trying to think of how I would feel. Cause I, what I like about the powerlifting, not that they're even comparable is that at least I'm in control. Right, like there's no one else to blame. And like, I just know in that position, I would be like, oh, this motherfucker. Like I would, I would foster that. But also I think in, in knowing how I would overcome that, I undoubtedly would have made my own mistakes that have cost people like, or cost my partner like the game or something like that. So in Mexico to go to the Olympics, we had to win this game the way the Volleyball is incredibly confusing and this is part of the reason our sport isn't as popular as it needs to be because you know in 40 minutes I've had to explain how my sport works <laughs> like five different ways yeah. instead of being like oh you just win the Stanley Cup and you did right. it right so these last chance Olympic qualifiers to go to the Olympics the way they work is we had to beat Mexico Davis Cup style with another Canadian team. And then if we did that, we had to play each other the next day. And whoever won went to the Olympics, whoever lost didn't go to the Why Olympics. Why don't you just fight each other with giant Q-tips, like American <laughs> Gladiator style? Like that seems like the dumbest way to get so, through. So that's what our federation did. So we played Mexico and lost, and then our other team played Mexico two and won. And then there's one set to 15, whoever wins that, that federation wins. And our second Jesus. team lost to the team that we lost to, so we didn't get to go. Long story short, the big gaffe, um, 
we were up 19-12 in the first set against Mexico. We win that set. We still have to win the second. But, you know, now we have momentum. Like, we're crushing you. We're up 19-12. I played, like, 19 of the best points I'd played all year. We lost 22-20. Oh, my God. Oh. Then we went out in the second set, and we were down 7-1 to start. So, like, mm-hmm. by Romantic all shit. means, by every internet troll that has ever seen the game, <laughs> I blew it and i i did we were up 19 12 everything was rolling and then it's like the yips it just nothing worked after Mm -hmm. that and i after the game losing in 2021 was so much better than losing in 2016 2016 after we lost i was so depressed i didn't want to play volleyball ever again like i i self-identified as the biggest failure in the world after 2021 i was like that was like so so bad that it's almost comical like i dropped the ball so hard, 19-12 to lose 24-22 and then come out and just be horrible the second set. It's just, you look back on that and you're like, everything that went wrong could have gone wrong. I prepared so wholeheartedly in the best possible way. And on that day, it just, it wasn't my day. It's like the 3-1 lead in hockey. Yeah. yeah. The 3-1 lead is the most dangerous lead yeah. to have because you're on your heels four, enough. Yeah. Because you've got to pull the goalie and then yeah. you end up getting fucked. It's usually 5-3. Uh, do you... In the moment while that's happening, because I, I mean, I played hockey as a kid, and this is the only comparison I have. But it's like, in the moment as it's happening, what's like the feeling? Is it like, do you panic? Do you like, oh fuck, oh fuck? Because it's like nineteen twelve, then it's nineteen thirteen. You're like, all right, whatever. It's still nineteen. Exactly. And then it's like nineteen seventeen. And now you're worried. So for the first little oh, while, I'm so anxious right now. For the first little while. Um, I mean, we can talk about that exact situation and how it's happened over the course of my career, um, which is hilarious. But in that particular moment, at first, you're just like, go with your strengths. Like, what are you strong at? Stop Mm -hmm. questioning what they're doing and just go with your strengths. And usually that gets you out of those situations. But then you get to a point where your strengths aren't working anymore and you've identified that and you need to do something different. So now you're using your weaknesses against arguably their strengths that's when it starts to get really uncomfortable because you're doing something you're not programmed to do consistently over and over and over um, in an attempt to find a solution. And that's where you start to feel like you're grasping and you're doing weird things. So yeah, once it gets up into that 1917, if you're the team that's climbing back in, you're licking your lips because you know they're reaching. They're just trying to find a solution to the problem. You just need to kind of let the problem unfold because you have the advantage but you should throw a sky ball like a yeah. boy you should have just yeah. fucking bobbed it up into, the, so in into the, the universe in the first game in 2016 we won the set uh in that davis cup style game and we were down by three or four and my partner skyballed and we came back and we won and so in that same game and i think this is why 2016 hurts so bad so we went to a third set to 15 winner goes to the olympics we were up 11 to 8 in the third set oh, going to 15. Fuck. so i'm landing Off. landing from plays i'm turning to you know my wife's in the crowd my family's in the crowd they all came up to north bay i don't know why it was in north bay but they all came up to watch this game and i'm i remember blocking a ball for 11 8 coming down and saying like I'm going to go to the Olympics. Like six months ago, no one said I was going to go to the Olympics. I'm going to go to the Olympics. And we lost 15-13 in the third set. So we only had to get four more points. They had to get, you know, seven or eight. And we still lost. And yeah, that one was, that one was tough. And I think it hurt so bad because like, you know, I'm doing a talk to a, you know, a business later this week, uh, you know, corporate talk. And I think something that people don't realize is I like, I live my life in four year blocks where everything comes down to 30 minutes. Like there's not many situations in your life where mm-hmm. you've prepared for four years. And at the end of this 30 minutes, it's, it's either yes or no. A lot of times in life, it's maybe. So mm-hmm. you have an opportunity to either go back in and clarify or do whatever. But for me, it's like, however many workouts you did, however many practices, however many tournaments you went to, it doesn't matter. It comes down to 30 minutes right now. And sometimes that's like so unbelievably overwhelming. You're volleyball Jocko. It's your 100% volleyball Jocko. I think like the interesting thing, because like I played obviously like point-based sports growing up, like rugby, football, I played basketball, um, and then obviously got sized out. Uh, But then I moved to like track and field. Then I tried out for bobsled. And like I wasn't a good bobsledder. I've never come on this podcast and pretended I was anything. But I think the biggest thing that was stressful in bobsled was there wasn't the opportunity to like, quote unquote, play harder. Like in some sports, you can kind of like give it the second effort. You know what I mean? Like 
you come out in the second half and you're like, I'm just going to try harder. Dude, yeah. I'd love Al Pacino to come out to like the four minutes. Yeah. Like, just give the Eddie the given, given Sunday. Sunday. It's, like, it's, it's not all of a sudden like, yeah. you just what, attach a motor to your ass? Like, and it's like that feeling like you said when, you know, you go out and you guys are up and then all of a sudden the other team takes the momentum and yeah. it's just like, kind of like the reins have been taken away from you. I know when Bob said like pushing a sled, knowing as I'm pushing it as hard as I can, I'm going, this isn't fast enough. And you just know, like there's a feeling like yeah. I pushed it fast yeah. a few times and then you'd go out and push it. And that's the same thing. It all comes down to 5.14 seconds. And you're just like, this isn't fast enough this time. And my job as a, as a brakeman was to push it for five seconds and then get in. And this poor guy has to drive it <laughs> for another minute. Yeah. And the full time, like a partnership, because I did two man, like I live with the other guy and he loses because I'm too slow. Not because he can't drive a sled. And it's like 58 seconds of being like, fuck, this is a long ride home. Yeah. Oh. No matter I'm what the pressure is in our sport or the perceived pressure, I'm thankful that I have like 35 to an hour to figure my shit out. Yeah. Because there's a lot of situations. We side change at seven. So the wind changes, yeah, okay. the sun changes. But there's a lot of times where I've been down 6-1 and I've won the game. There's a lot of times yeah. where I've been up 6-1 and I've lost the game. But at least... Yeah. Like you think about pinnacle events, world championships, you work so hard to make world championships, the Olympics. If you're out there and you're uncomfortable, you got 30 minutes at least to settle in yeah. and bring something. You're a hundred meter sprinter. Like if you don't do it in qualifying one, you're done. Yeah. Right. But I think the difference with those, and I don't think the parallel with bobsled is perfect, but mm. You kind of know because the driver, oh, you do. The, the driver's the variable. You yeah. know, if you push the sled 5.14, we're, we're good as long as he does his job. Sprinting, I know if I run a 10, I'm going to be in the final. Yeah. There's comfort in that, I yeah. think. Like Donovan 100%. Bailey knew that he was going to win the Olympics, right? He woke up and he's like, all I have to do is run this time and I, and I win the Olympics. And he went out and did it. But you just got to do your job and, nice. and you win, right? Yeah. I think there's similar with powerlifting, right? You yeah. kind of know your numbers. And with the age of social media, you probably know going into the meet, yeah. unless somebody's hiding the, it, the people that you're going to win. win. Well, my thing is I'd rather get it over with because one of the most difficult things to do is not only sit with it, but sit with it and do something about it. Like that's where the 30 minutes to me seems like torture. Because it's like, I'd rather know in 9.58 seconds. Just or, one serve. Just right. one point, winner wins the well, game. Well, I'd rather, yeah, I'd literally just go... Click. All right, <laughs> sweet. Right, because I think that's the most difficult thing psychologically to sit with is like in those situations where you're like, no, you're if you're in this and this is bad, it's still going to be bad for a decent amount of time. Where it's like, if my hamstring pops, it's like, well, all right, we're done here. Yeah, like, we're going home. I think like when I I played rugby and I played at a relatively high level when I played and I was a fly half, so that would be like your pitcher, your captain, your point guard. It was like I knew if we lost and it came down to it, I can look at the scorecard. And I can go, I checked these boxes. Yeah. Like I can only score so many tries. I can only complete so many passes. Like I hand off the ball. It's like a quarterback. Yeah. It's like my completion is here. This is what I can do, right? You guys take it across the line. And I think that's a good point. As long as you went out there and like, there's a big difference between losing 15, 13 in the third set. You gave it your all and like you went to war. Yeah. And losing, you know, 15, two, because you thought you were too hot and you just, your mind gave up and you were like, oh, physically I can't do this anymore. That feels like shit. If, if even if you are destroyed, you have heat stroke and you still go out there and you try as hard as you can and you lose, it's like, I know I'm going to lose the game. I have heat stroke, but at least I gave it my all. So I'm interested with like, you know, you brought up this corporate event and, you know, as we talk about it more like the psychological turmoil that playing at this level must have is it, do talks like that stem from the wins or losses so i'll tell you right now i've lost a whole lot more in my career than i've won that's like it's inevitable if you're not one of the top four or five teams you you end every single week on a loss right so i mm -hmm. think for the the longest time i adopted this mentality of the one percent better every day right and now that is like i hate that saying <laughs> so oh, please oh, join join oh, the group God. So, yes hi uh can we get gary v in here real quick please the continue. reason i hate that is because for me we know that i'll wake up at four o'clock in the morning and go to the gym no problem like doing the work is not 
hard for me. I enjoy it. But what happened is that 1% constantly made me question every single thing I did. Mm -hmm. I was like, I never appreciated what I was doing really, really well and focusing my time there. I was always searching for like, okay, what can I do tomorrow that I'll get 1% better at today? And I'd always find something that I'm like average at, but focusing on that never made me any better. It just distracted me from doing what I was actually good at. And, um, it made me super depressed because I always felt like I was never doing enough. No matter how I was, when things were like really bad, I was working out two or three times a day. I was training twice a day. Like I was going and doing like full sessions of isometric only exercises so I could be doing work without like physio physiologically, like completely depleting myself. And then I'd go to practice. Then I would do a lift. Then I would practice again. Like my entire life revolved around anything I could do to be better. And it just, it made me so depressed because all I thought was like that I was crappy at volleyball because I only self-identified with mistakes I made. And then I finally made the realization that like what you're doing is enough. Like you are incredible and stop focusing on the 1%, start focusing on the 99 and things are going to be a whole, at least a whole lot more fun. Um, and it just, it made a huge difference. So like when I see these memes, not even memes, infographics on mm -hmm. Instagram, like if you post a get 1%, bar graph on your thing like immediately you're unfollowed i cannot stand that <laughs> it, it's so funny like it, kind of like going back to what you're saying and i think a thing that took a lot of my anxiety away from playing sports or trying to do anything better was i looked at like losing as an inevitable existence like the constant is loss because if you play a point-based sport both teams start at zero like i can go out and do nothing and lose the other team can go out and do nothing and lose like that is the constant the variable is winning so i thought like the anxiety of the the option of losing doesn't even exist. Like this will happen if I don't do something. So it allowed me to focus only on like the actionable items forward. Exactly. And I think and that always you, helped me in sports. When you start to identify with those and stop identifying with wins and losses, like that's what I did. I missed the 2016 Olympics. So I was like, I am a horrible volleyball player. Uh, like I will never be successful in the sport. Me I too. lost I in 2016. And I am a terrible volleyball player. <laughs> so it, it, it was terrible because everything about me was like, we had a good tournament, great week. We had a bad tournament, like yeah. self-destruction, like self-sabotage. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to punish myself because I lost. And the only way that I'll win is if I work harder. And as soon as I like let that go, things became a lot easier. And it's the same sense of like the corporate world, like you're not your job. Like Jordan Shallow at the end of the day is Jordan Shallow. It doesn't matter what what happened in corporate America or Dubai in this case now, but you'll always be you, right? And I think once you figure that out, it's pretty powerful. I just don't think a lot of people take the time to do that, to figure out who they are. They just, who are you? I'm a lawyer. Like, who are you? I'm a doctor. It's, that's what you do. That's not who you are. So when people say like, oh, like, what do you do? It's like, oh, I'm a professional volleyball player. It's like, well, when you self-identify with that, it really sucks when you're losing week after week. Instead, it's a lot easier to just be yourself. Mental exercise. 2016, don't make the games. You hang it up. What's Sam doing now? Because that's something that I've seen a lot with like Olympics, especially because it's so thankless. Like yeah. knowing people who've gone through sliding sports is, is a pretty popular one in Canada, obviously. But like the identity of Olympic athletes, because there's not the notoriety of like, I, I think of Brooks in... Um, in Shawshank Redemption. Like my ex-wife went through it when she finished sliding. It was like the identity so wrapped up into something that when you're in this microcosm, like you you go into a volleyball, like, oh, that's that's Pedlo. That's the fucking lumberjack sledgehammer. Like watch your throats. <laughs> the guy's going to be gutted for you. But you go to the grocery store. It's like, I wonder if that guy plays basketball. So that's what I get the question I get all the time. is like, do you play basketball? I played basketball in grade 11 for half a semester and then walked away because I was so bad. But you go with it. I would go with it. for I least amount of follow-up questions. What do you do for a living? I'm a drug dealer. People go, yep. <laughs> and then they just keep going. But it's like, imagine in 2016, after that, when you're in this sort of like self-deprecating 1% better, if you would have packed it in, like, wh where do you think you'd be at now? So I think if I were to have quit then, my life would be a lot different than like me slowly phasing myself out now. I think if I stopped then, it'd be like, like a dark end to the story. It was really bad for a while because... That's all, I, that's all I did for four years. Like I've been with my wife for 15 years. And for some of those years, I've been on the road for more than half the year. And then when I'm at home, it's like what we, like she eats 
like she's a professional athlete. Like it's not fancy. It's like, we're going to eat beef and rice tonight because that's going to be enough calories to sustain me for tomorrow. And like, we're going to stretch while we watch TV because I need to practice tomorrow. And she was a hundred percent on board all the time. And it, it was amazing. But after 2016, that's all I had. I wasn't practicing as physio or anything. I wasn't working on building something outside of those like eight by eight meters in the sand. So I don't know what I would have done. I would have walked straight back into a clinic, but I think there would have been a lot of demons buried that just never got addressed and eventually like unburied themselves and made a mess. But after 2016 and then moving on to, uh, like a higher ranked athlete, I was like thrown right into a situation where things were stable for a while because our world ranking at the time was like as high as seventh in the world. So money was a little bit more consistent. Um, you felt like more of a professional athlete. So it made like immersing yourself in the sport a little bit easier. But at the same time, I was also able to take some of the energy where I felt like I have to train so hard to be good enough to even do this and take that and put it into other areas. So that's where I started to like brand myself and, you know, work on online training and social media obligations um, and things like that. And kind of come to this realization that I'm a lot more than just this person that's in this sport. So, you know, now it's 2021, I'm like on the tail end of my career, I'm starting to, to work in the clinic and I'm comfortable with that. You know, I'm not like trying to grasp at straws and say like, I need to play more events. I've played like 150 international events. I don't need to play more volleyball just to prove to myself that I did it. And I think that that's in 2016, what I was trying to do, I was trying to prove that I was a professional athlete without even realizing I already was. What are the big ones that you look back at that are like, the fuck yeah moments. Because I feel like we've spent the last 20 minutes going, so tell me about all the shit. So I thought that's what you're going to ask me was the shit again. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm because right, we're I, going yeah, there. We're going to do a shit sandwich. Put yeah. the shit in the middle. And then we're going to wrap on like, what are the fuck yeah moments where you're on the other side of like the uh, the seven or the 18, 11, and you're like, oh fuck, or the 19, 11, and at yeah. least 25, 24. Like, what are the moments where you, you look back and be like, all right, these ones here? Yeah, so there's a couple. My partner and I in 2000, um, like 14, 15, we were playing on like the B level circuit, the North Sica, North America, Central America, Caribbean. And in order to get to the next level, we had to win a bunch of those. And I'd never won any international events. And my partner and I went off and like, we made something like six finals in a row. And then we were able to finally get into like the grand slams, the highest level tournaments. So for us, it was like, we're coming from nothing. And we, in one season, we're able to work ourselves into a position where now we're world tour players. So I mean like small success at the start, but it was like a big hurdle to realize like we could actually be successful at this level. Cause there are very, very few of those people in Canada. Like there are four of us that play at my level in the entire country. And it's just, it is what it is. It's so difficult to break in. And we, we hopped that hurdle to get our feet into, you know, the water, but then, you know, moving with my other partner, um, Sam Schachter in 2016, you know, we, our first tournament, we won the continental championships. We won it against Cuba and then Cuba just came off a fifth at the Olympics. So my partner went to the Olympics. They didn't do particularly well. And then we played the, probably the hottest team at the Olympics who didn't make the medal rounds. And then we beat them too straight to do that. So it was like, no one on paper thought we were gonna do that. And then we had a few other um, successes. There was an invitational in California. It was in between an event in Poland and one in Vienna. So we played in Poland, then flew to the US for four days, played an event and then flew straight back to Austria to play the next event. And this invitational, we ended up making the final, but the Americans love to manipulate the tournament in any way, shape or form that is advantageous for the Americans. So this tournament, what they did for this invitational was they put all the Americans on one side and all of the internationals on the other side. So there's like four strong American teams, but they had 12 of them. So they yeah. knew those four teams are gonna make the quarterfinals and out of the 12 world teams, only four were gonna make it. So we made it out and then in the semifinal again, we had to play Europeans. And we ended up playing the final against the Americans. But it was just one of those events where we were an alternate. So mm. we weren't even invited. And then like three days before, we're like, screw it. We're going to fly from Poland and we're going to play this thing. And we ended up making the finals on NBC against the guy who won the Olympics in 2008. So that, that was a huge one. But I think the biggest was the way our federation, I'm sure it's with bobsled as well. You're funded based on performance. 
And so for volleyball, you have to achieve a certain number of fifth place finishes in the world to be funded. And the very last tournament of the year, we flew to China because we still needed one more fifth to, to make our funding. And we're going through, we won our pool, which was great. First round of playoffs, we play Qatar. Qatar is like a super hot team. We're up by a few points in the first set and the guy lands on me and I sublux my calcaneus. <gasps> so like out it goes, they put it back, it pops itself back in. At this point, I'm like, okay, I didn't roll my ankle, but my foot is on fire. So I'm saying, okay, I'm going to call a medical timeout. I have five minutes to get my shit together to finish the game or I'm done. China doesn't have two inch white tape. They have one inch white tape, no two inch. So Scale. I know I need to tape my ankle to continue. And their medical staff comes over and what do they do instantly? I'm like, I have five minutes and five minutes only. My foot's covered in sand. They spray it with water. And I'm like, great, this tape is really going to stick to this water now. So I like fan dangle and ankle tape. I get it all together. We go back out there. We win the first set, which is great. I tell my partner, I'm like, this is bad. We'll see what happens in the second set. If we need, if we're down by a bunch, we'll forfeit. We'll go to the third and we'll see if we can win this. Because if we win this game, I get funded. So it was like... It's like a $20,000 game. I just need to win this game. We end up pulling it off in the third. We win it. We get our funding. We're like on a high at this point because we're like, great. Moving into the Olympic year, we're going to have funding. We end up playing a German team in the quarterfinal. And I'm kind of like, you know what? We might be able to beat these guys on like a bum leg. Like if we can beat these guys, we get to the semi. Like this is great. If it hurts and we're down by a bunch, let's just forfeit and go home. Win the first set. I'm like, oh my God, what the hell is happening? Second set, we go down like a bunch. And I'm like, all right, this is the game plan. We're just going <laughs> to, you're just going to serve Fall the ball it. over the net. And I'm going to say, screw it. And we're going to go to a third. Won the third. So now we're in the semifinal. We're supposed to fly to Vegas the next day. We're like, fuck it. Let's try. Like Vegas is another tournament. We're not just going to party. But like, let's just try in the semifinals and see what happens. We end up playing these Russian guys who are coming off a bronze medal at the Olympics or silver medal. Same Seminoff, he's like seven foot two. We served him the first ball. I went up to block and he hit it like two feet over my hands. And then I think like 11 points later, we forfeited the rest of the tournament. <laughs> but that was a huge That's win insane. because for us, so that was a four star. Our tournaments go up to five stars. So it's the second highest level in the world. And like we made the semifinal on a bum ankle. We got our funding and like it was a good way to end the year, but also like the biggest kick in the pants because it's the only semifinal at that level I've ever made. So it was like the best tournament I've ever had, but also like we just got thrashed in the semifinal. That's always, I mean, sports are just such a good, like proving ground for life. So like you could lose in sports so you don't have to die in your actual yeah. life. Cause it's like, I'm sure now like setting your trajectory, is it difficult to not have this quadrennial framework of like you're living anymore? Like, I mean, I think what it's done is it's inject like a level of enjoyment into the game that I haven't had in a long time. So like going out and training now, I'm not worried at this particular moment in time about being the best player I could possibly be because in four weeks there's a tournament. So I've been going out with a lot of young guys and just trying to like mentor them and, and just have a lot of fun. And I think my, you know, pathway penciled out four years now, the end goal or the highlight doesn't have anything to do with volleyball it has everything to do with the other side of my life physical therapy training you know the gym and and that's exciting in its own mind because for the last 10 years mm -hmm. I haven't had that opportunity to you know invest myself in that area as you mentor young players do you find yourself leaning more towards that angle or is it still very much when you have a young player it's like all right let's just nail the technical stuff like let's get the next bearded like canadian lumberjack sledgehammer like over the net or is it like hey look man like or do you feel like it's necessary to go through that like this 2016 necessary for you to be here and have this kind of perspective like do you because i always think of this question where people are like well if you could give yourself advice as a younger person i was like well, you're cool with where you're at. And if you're cool with where you're at, you probably shouldn't take any advice and change this trajectory. Like you find yourself having to catch your, yourself in giving advice to young players where you're like, look, man, like it's just a game because it wasn't just a game to you. And yeah. you're someone worth taking advice from. Yeah, so I think the thing that's been missing in volleyball in particular, maybe in the Canadian sports system, is that opportunity to mentor younger players. I've I've never had anyone to bounce ideas off or like tell me that it's gonna be okay. It mm -hmm. was like, you're out there by yourself, figure it out. Or if you don't, it's okay. You're just, you're not gonna make it and then you're done. 
Um, and I think that that's where I have a lot of perspective and value to add to still the Canadian volleyball system is taking some of these young guys and getting them not only more proficient at the sport, but mentally in a better space to be able to do that. Because, yeah, it's very easy to immerse yourself completely in this and it's all you have. And then when it goes south, it goes south fast and hard versus understanding that this is like a long-term play. Week after week doesn't matter, but can you create a season? You know, I've had some of my best seasons where I've lost in the qualifier, so I don't even get into the main tournament. I went to China, I fly, I flew there, I played two games, I lost the second one. I don't even get into the tournament where I start to make money, so I'm just in the hole. I've had years where I've done that three, four, five times in a row, five weeks in a row in Asia, and then you go to Europe and you string together five, six weeks of, you know, success. So just, you know, bringing a broader perspective to some of these guys and, you know, instilling some of the principles early on that it's not just about hitting this ball back and forth in a court, but you need to do something more. And I think that the new wave of volleyball players needs to understand that the new wave of athletes, mm -hmm. you know, especially like even with the name, image and likeliness for the NCAA mm -hmm. coming out, these kids all just think stuff's going to be given to them for free. And it's like, sure, you can put bar stool athlete on your thing and maybe they invite you to a party once in a while, but that's not what you want to do. You want to build something outside of the court that you can leverage through your athleticism. And when you do that, you know, the bump, the setting and spiking, it doesn't really matter if they pay you or they don't pay you because you've created a system in itself that allows you to be independent of that. There's a lot of pressure out there if you're like, if I don't score this one point, I can't pay my rent this month. But if you've created a structure where you're able to make income as an athlete outside of only your performance, I think that's where things are going. How important for you was it to have a like a physical therapy background or have a background as a physical therapist? Like did it ever cross your mind like that old, well, I could always just as a fallback do this? Like was that a safety net for you or was that a crutch? Or like how important is that in, like was that then in 2016 versus now where it's like you're moving back into clinical practice again? So in 2012, I graduated from Western with a master's of physio. I started working in a clinic and I was like, I can do both these things. I can train from eight in the morning until one. I can work from three until eight. Like this will work. And then every year, like four or five weeks in, I'd have to take a full week off of work and only train. And then as, again, 2016, no one really thought we were going to go to the Olympics. So I worked part time for a few months all the time to make enough money to play volleyball. It was like, it was why I was able to spend money on volleyball. But then I realized it was holding me back more than it was pushing me forward, so I quit. So from 2016 to 2020, I didn't work at all uh, until September of 2021. I don't think there was ever like, if this doesn't work out, I can just fall back on physio. It more was when I'm done doing this, whether it worked out or did not work out, mm -hmm. I have put myself in a situation that not many other Canadian athletes in volleyball are in. Like I finished my master's in a professional degree. I can just walk into a clinic and start work. Like. I don't have to go through the crazy thing of what am I going to do with my life? It's already there. It's just waiting to start per se. And that's what I did was I put it on hold for so, so long. And I think that's why 2021 is a little bit different because it's like, well, now the time is to shift my focus, not completely, but more evenly between the two, because for four years it was every single day, 24 hours a day. How can I be the best volleyball player I can be? I can't dedicate any of that mental space to, you know, why someone's shoulder hurts. Now, how do you split up your time? So I work three days a week in the clinic, uh, and I haven't played volleyball since the Olympic, like trials. Really? Yeah. So there's nothing, for the first time in my life, I've had an opportunity where it's like, if I'm not training right now, it's okay. All of these other years, like to put it in perspective, I finished training in um, September, finished competing. And then my off season was October knee surgery. I had to be back in the sand by middle of December because the first tournament was in January. So like that's my typical off season. Finish, medical procedure, back in, go at it again. So it's not always major, but like PRP in my shoulder. Mm -hmm. So I had PRP done twice on my Supra. It's like, well, that's gonna take six to eight weeks before you feel any good. So there's your off season. Your off season was spent rehabbing your shoulder. Now you go straight back into practice, compete. And that's what it's been every year for eight years. So now it's like, I don't have to do that. I'm just going to step away a little bit. I'm going to go into the gym and do like non-sport specific work. I'm just going to do what I enjoy and I'm going to hit it hard. And then when the time comes that it makes sense to start practicing full out again, then 
then we start doing that. What has been the one thing you've enjoyed most with your like newfound time? Like what's the one thing that maybe like when you obviously couldn't dedicate time to that now as you dedicate time to you're like, oh, like this is something that I maybe not miss, but I'm enjoying doing now. Yeah. So honestly, spending time with my family. So like before I moved to the States to train outside of quarantine restrictions or whatever it COVID was doing at the time. I moved to Florida. Uh, I had a baby eight weeks before. So I left my eight week old baby. I moved to Florida for three and a half months to train volleyball a hundred percent of the time. Um, and then I got to come back and like spend all day, every day with my baby, which was amazing. Um, because to like leave a little eight week old was, was just wild. But even before that, like, this is how all in we had to be. When I had surgery, I flipped my basement. We had a basement apartment, so I completely redid it because the plan was when we have the baby, my mother-in-law was going to move in and live in the basement and take care of the baby with my wife so I could train wholeheartedly. I didn't have to wake up in the middle of the night. I didn't have to worry about X, Y, and Z with the baby. That would all be taken care of because I had to make the Olympics. Everyone was bought in on this situation. So like I had an eight week old, but I, I wasn't a dad. I was just, I was there. What it became was my mother-in-law lived upstairs. I lived in the basement the entire time. It had a full kitchen. I have a sauna down there and my full gym. So I would wake up, make breakfast, work out, go to practice, come home. And like, that was my life. I, all I was doing was focusing on being the best possible volleyball player I could be at the expense of my wife, my baby, all of these things. Because for four years, it's coming down to an hour game. Mm -hmm. I better be ready for that game. Now that's all done. So it's, it's no longer that. If it's like, hey, I want to work out. It's four o'clock in the morning. This is when I should be working out and my baby's up. It's like, okay, well, I can just take care of my baby because this workout really doesn't matter as much as it maybe did six months ago. Yo, shout out the mother-in-law with the yeah. real MVP, man. It, insane. And I, uh, people ask me like, oh, are you super excited to go back to your kid when I was traveling away? And I was like, I am, but I'm, I'm also terrified right. mm -hmm. because I had a baby and I became a dad and you adopt this mentality of being a dad. And then I went away and... I wasn't a dad anymore. Mm -hmm. I was just like an image on a phone. Right. And I'm like, if I come home and my baby doesn't like recognize me or is scared of me, like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm depressed. I just lost to go to the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. I can't come home yet because there's a two week quarantine. And then like, as soon as they lifted that, I got on a plane and started coming home. And I was like, if my baby doesn't know who I am or isn't excited to see me, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I'm just going to go back and live in the basement. Oh, it's crazy, man. So moving forward, what's the, what's the game plan now? Like more focus on clinical practice, volleyball development, like yes. what is, what are the big things you got, got in the pipe? So after I took some time off, after I got back spending time with family, I started up in a clinic. So I'm working at mend physio three days a week. It's just 16 hours, which is perfect. And then I'm come see you. Yeah, right. I'm so busted. I need to come see you. <laughs> <laughs> you did. This is it. This is the only value I give. So we can work on my knee after. Great. But, um, yeah, it's really it's really nice there, but it's also intimidating. Like I'm by far the most junior therapist when it comes to clinical experience and, you know, interacting with patients. I know I'll get there, but I enjoy being the, the most junior because I'll always work hard to improve my skills and, you know, my patient outcomes or whatever it might be. And then the other three days a week, I just, I work on my own stuff. So, you know, I have my website. I'm programming for like 20 to 25 guys down in the States. And then I just make programs to sell on my website because there's a huge gap uh, when it comes to like training volleyball athletes. It's just, there's not many people out there doing it. And the people who are doing it have no concept of what's happening. I'm not a, you know, I know you guys are, when it comes to like, do you need uh, the good life personal trainer certification or N N what is it, NSCS? Like, do you need those to be good at making someone physically fit for the sport of volleyball? I don't think so because I think people who have those are just going about it completely the wrong way. I, so I think your physical therapy schools yeah. kind of got you covered and the surpassed. fact you've done it for so long. Yeah. And honestly, to me, it's uh, I like training for volleyball more than I ever liked playing volleyball. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I found you guys and got into it was through volleyball, was through Lauren oh, Frederick's husband. Shout out. Yeah. God, though, I Andrew. thought you were a tree. Andrew's got to be taller than you. Stanford. He's like a 6'11". Well, maybe six eight but he's he's a tall drink of water andrew fendrick could you just see how tall he is but that's how i i found you guys and well ultimately i found you through him but like latched on to well, what do you, you know guys how that doing. conversation went down he told me that you were basically the 270 pound version i was of me. well see that's a that's a polite version they told you they told me i'm the short you okay. <laughs> that's how it went down they're like and it was the most profiled thing ever 
Because they're like, oh, yeah, you know what? Do you know this Canadian guy? It was like, fuck off, American people. Like, yep. I don't know the Canadian guy. And they're like, yeah, he's like, you we know, a white guy with a beard. And I was like, okay. I'm like, do we all look alike? And she showed me a picture. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, I was like, damn it. He's good. She's Anyone gone. who's from Windsor, I asked them if they know you guys. Really? So, yeah. I'm like, these are the kings of Windsor. You apparently. should add Lundy to that list. Yeah. Lundy's, Lundy's also. Lundy's the true yeah, king of Windsor. Yeah, he's the king of Windsor. The meta god. But yeah, it's funny how that that kind of came to be. But to your point earlier about like being, like you said, you were a junior clinician. Bullshit. Yeah. You know how many clinicians have never subluxed the calcaneus in Shenzhen or wherever the fuck you were, and then played with one inch tape with a bunch of water fucking yeah. on your. Oh no, yeah. I think you're probably you're the most senior clinician that's out there. Uh, I don't know about that. But I'll, how, take, I'll take the well, call. Well, no, but how that. much of how much of clinical work is understanding the psychological component of it right so, like yeah i say that all the time it's that you know whether you're uh, you're training someone or you're a physio or a chiro or a doctor like whatever we do under those roles there's also a like you're a clinical psychologist at a certain point mm. right you need to either create buy-in or mm -hmm. remove fear or barriers to exercise or whatever it might be so when it comes to the junior therapist that's like Continuing education wise, I don't have the credentials that that you know my my colleagues have. But where I do feel like I'm strong is, we know that most meaningful change is coming from patients uh, like taking their own rehab under control, whether it be through exercise or or mentality. And uh, that's what I'm trying to promote is like we need to get you moving and. I am hopeful that I know how to get you to do that through exercise, through coaching or whatever it might be, because, you know, we're starting to understand that some of the hands-on stuff, it, it, we're getting into this weird, I don't know if you're seeing it in Cairo, but there's a lot of guys out there that are like, if it's not evidence-based, like what are, you yeah. are doing, you are neglecting your patients if nice. you're doing something that's not evidence-based, yeah. right? So we know that if we get people to exercise, most of the time they're gonna get better. You just have to convince them that that is the right thing to do. Dude, I think the most evidence-based thing out there is the loss in Mexico. That to me, cause yeah. that'd get me, cause I wanna go train right now. Cause it's like fucking Mexicans were sandbagging us. That's bullshit. And it, and it rained, they probably made it rain. Like, I don't know if, if, if buy-in is the goal, a guy with a pocket protector and a bunch of like peer reviewed journals versus like, a guy who's been sending trenches, it for like yeah, a decade. Yeah. It's like, that's what I'm buying into. Yeah. And it's, a, it's exciting. Honestly, people, you know, they ask you like, oh, are you working with athletes? And it's like, well, if one walks through the door, then great. But when you're working with like the general population, it's what I like about it is everything is always a puzzle and you mm -hmm. just need to like, there's no correct way to do the puzzle. You just have to convince the patient that that is the way the puzzle is solved mm -hmm. and they will get better. And I think we love to make it super complicated by saying like, you know, we need to adjust here or like if I press on this, it's doing this. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if we can get someone to do a single leg RDL effectively, they're probably lower body wise going to get better at something. Okay. Well, let's go do that and let's go actually train because I'm still fired up over the, all the volleyball stories and, and frankly, all the L's. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate you taking the time coming yeah, out. It's a so long time in the works. So, well, yeah. I appreciate you guys Being, having me. Uh, been a fan of your stuff since since day jump when i realized i had a taller brother in ontario and um <laughs> so in the toronto area you're at which clinic men physio so queen and carla okay it's just at men physio on instagram and then yourself at pedlo samuel killian dot hamilton yeah london jack production rx radio thanks for your time man appreciate it appreciate awesome. you having me